Well, hello, y'all. We're back to building batteries, and a lot has been said about the potential for fire. People are worried that they might burn their house down. I'm telling you, that's not what's going to burn your house down. What's going to burn your house down is bad connections. So today, we're going to talk about how to make good connections. The biggest problem with doing your own electrical work is not knowing how to make good connections. It's really important that the connections that we make have three things. One is they need to be secure. If there's any looseness in that connection, arcing will occur and you'll end up melting things, starting fires. The next thing is that it has to be durable. And by durable, I mean you have to create a joint that will not corrode or loosen over time. Because we're building this for decades, not for weeks. And it also needs to have good conductivity. We need to minimize the resistance. The resistance is going to cause a lot of inefficiency, but it's also going to cause heating, which leads to bad results. So... There's a lot of connections we're going to be making, and I decided that today we'll just talk about that. And so we have the right tools here. It looks like a mess, but we have the right tools here to make good connections. That is a 16-ton hydraulic crimper. This is a 10-ton hydraulic crimper, and they're used to make these connections and when we make these connections what we try to do is we try to create what's called a gas tight joint what we're doing is we're basically forcing the copper together in this crimping these lugs and forcing the copper together in a way that forces all air out of it we don't want any way for oxygen to get in there and corrode that wire over time because if it does it will loosen up and it will arc now that is a copper wire inside of a lug but it looks like all one solid thing because it was done correctly with this smaller hydraulic crimper there's just no gap there that is a joint that will last forever. It will not create any heat. Here's another one. Same thing. You can't tell where the lug stops and the copper starts. This is one of the first ones that I did. You can see the wire. And then you can see what happens when you tighten the lug down. This is one of the first ones I did, and I didn't get the wire in there far enough. So when I cut this one off, there were a bunch of little loose wires inside here because I only crimped it once. Since then, I've made sure that the wires pushed further down in, and I crimp it twice on each one. This has two solid crimps underneath it. And then, in order to make sure that we don't get any oxygen in, we use a nice heat shrink tubing that has an adhesive. If you look really close, you can see a shiny, that's a melted adhesive that we use the heat gun to uh, shrink and that activates the adhesive and seals out any air or moisture from being able to get into the joint that we worked so hard to create. And then it's important that we use the right torque to make our connections. So this was used on the, maybe you didn't see the video, maybe you did. Go look at the video of the combiner box that I did. That combiner box required 20 foot pounds of torque on every one of those lugs. And so we use that to do that. These batteries require four Newton meters, five Newton meters to tighten up the lugs. And so you wanna use a much more precise and uh, 
a tool that operates in that short, that smaller range. This uses inch pounds or Newton meters in very small increments. And so that's important for making the joints on the battery. You don't want to over torque those and damage the terminal, but you also don't want to um, under torque them to where the heating, the heat cycles uh, from using the battery make them loosen up. So you also want to use some type of fastening device, either a split ring washer or a serrated washer. The nuts that we use for these uh, batteries, a lot of times they have a serration in them that makes it where when they loosen uh, or when they tighten, they lock into place so they can't back off. And that's important. Um, and then it's the preparing the wire to actually be used is important. Some people want to, some people think that solder is a way to make a better joint. And in some cases it is, but not in anything that we're doing and not in any uh, electrical work, unless you're talking about low voltage or uh, lighting the small LED connections are sometimes done with solder. But what happens with solder in the joints that we're talking about? You, you, you really can't improve on that. That's called cold weld. When you put solder in there, what you do is you create gaps between the wires. The, bond, the wire strands themselves do not bond with one another as well. And that solder with vibration or um, heat cycles can recrystallize or in overheating instances, it has been known to melt. Um, it's just, it, solder has no place in what we're doing. All right, in preparing the wire, you need to make sure that you have good, clean, fresh wire. This wire is six gauge wire. I got this wire uh, it was SO cable and I made an extension cord out of it 30 years ago and I never did anything to protect the ends from allowing uh, water vapor uh, or oxygen from getting into it and so what you'll find is that there's corrosion and you can see the blackness there's corrosion this is the end of the wire where it was tied into the electric panel and that corrosion transmits down the line. You can see really corroded wire. You wouldn't really want to crimp a lug onto that and try to make a good joint where you're dealing with wire that already has corrosion in it. So how far does that corrosion tra travel through the wire? I can tell you that I found corrosion eight feet from the end of this wire. It goes a long way. So. Make sure you're using nice, clean wire, and if it's not, replace it. Get good wire, because we want to be able to sleep at night. Now, one other thing you can do when you uh, are putting lugs on is you can use high carbon conductivity paste. And this stuff I've tested, it will improve the conductivity, the amount of amperage that can flow through a joint it improves it by about 30%. It cuts the resistance by about 30%. Now, that's gonna be quite variable because if you have two surfaces that mate perfectly, you're not gonna improve on it as much with that. But what this does is this can take up the small amount of, um, of roughness and uh, inconsistencies in the surfaces. I have seen people uh, talk about polishing their bus bars so that they mate perfectly. And I've been doing things like this for decades, and I can promise you that when you try to polish two surfaces to meet together by holding them on a grinder or something, you're not going to do it. It's not really going to happen. While we're on the subject of bus bars, this is kind of a painful subject. These bus bars, and I, I haven't read a lot about this, but I have found that these bus bars, they don't show up flat. 
And I don't know if you can see that on the image, but these bus bars are not flat. There's a gap there. And what that means is where that bus bar meets the terminal, it's not sitting flat on there. And you are not gonna pull that out of there by tightening up the bolt, uh, unless it's really minor. It takes more strength than that. So the first thing I do when I start working with these bus bars is I flatten them. And that's just, that just takes a process of, of flattening it. And now, let me get my glasses on because this is important. I need to see this better. That's not there yet. Now, I typically do this out there on my workbench. This table's not strong enough, so it's getting some, some bending. It's, it's bouncing. But that's kind of flattening. And one of the things that I see that I don't like is they put, um, people put these, number 10 wire terminals on top of their bus bar and then tighten it down with these big quarter inch bolts, these six millimeter bolts, uh, nuts. And you can't get a proper long lasting torque by doing that. And you can't get that serrated nut to bite into your bus bar and not back off if it's also on top of this little terminal. So that terminal acts as like a slippy joint later to allow that to loosen up. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these bus bars and I'm drilling into them and tapping them and using a number six, um, I'm sorry, a four millimeter, uh, four, yeah, four millimeter screw, three millimeter maybe, three millimeter screw to tighten down the sensing lead so that it's not interfering with getting the right torque and the not right joint on that bus bar. So in order to do that, that, that requires a little effort. In order to do that, I've built a little fixture here. I don't want to hold this in my hand and try to drill this. That's kind of dangerous. But I built this little fixture that will hold it in place. And I purchased these. These are really nifty. These are drill bits that also tap your thread. And I have been taking these out to the shop and pre-drilling a hole in these with the bench press to make this a lot easier, but I'm gonna go ahead and just do it all at one, one go here. Pretty simple. Now, I'm gonna use a Dremel tool and I'm gonna clean this burring off. It'll look like this when I'm done, but I won't make you suffer through that. But that needs to be nice and smooth when I get done. And I went ahead and did all the bus bars for this project. And then I was watching somebody's video and they were talking about using flexible bus bars. And I have been testing short pieces of wire. She used, uh, it was Digital Mermaid, she used a piece of four gauge wire, a little shorter than this one, piece of four gauge wire to make flexible bus bars because she's putting her batteries in a boat. And she's worried that they may move around and she doesn't want to put stress on the terminals. Well, I, uh, commented to her and said that I had measured my bus bars and they had measured with my tester, my milliohm tester, my IR tester, that they had measured 0.17 milliohms. Well, 
I'm getting 0 0.15, 0 0.16, 0 0.17. Depends on how far apart because the further apart I get them, the more resistance. But when I measured this four gauge wire with a couple of terminals on it, I get 0.27. So there's more resistance in this piece of wire than there is in this bus bar. Now, 0.17, that's also about the resistance that I had in one of the cells, so I didn't think too much of it. Until I started to look at these, these two bus bars came with a different batch of batteries than the big battery order that these bus bars came in. And this morning, I put the tester on this bus bar and I came up with 0 0.04 milliohms. Huh. Why do I have four times the resistance of this bus bar than I do this bus bar? That's like the difference between the resistance of copper and brass. Oh, Lord. So I took these two bus bars out to the shop. And I ground the ends off of both of them. And sure enough, all these bus bars I did this work to, they're brass. And the ones that I used to make my solar generator were copper. And so now, I'm afraid I'm gonna take all these bus bars and throw them in the trash having spent a few hours getting them all prepped and ready to go. And I'm gonna end up ordering a bunch of copper bus bars because I believe that this copper bus bar is actually the minimum amount that I wanna use. This is two millimeters by 20 millimeters. So 40 millimeters squared is the same as a one aught copper wire in area. And I have no problem carrying this amperage through this battery with one aught copper wire. But when you divide that by four and you talk about 10 millimeters, well, that's like this wire. This is 10 millimeter wire. And this 10 millimeter wire that's 1.05 milliohms. That's one milliohm just in that piece of wire. And that's about 18 inches long. And if you take this 0.17 milliohms, about three inches apart. Multiply that by six, you get about one milliohm. So, yeah, these are about the same as eight gauge wire. And I don't think I wanna tie this all together with eight gauge wire. Most of the time it would be fine, but under the heaviest loads that this battery sees, they're gonna warm up, they're gonna heat up. Now, eight gauge wire with an insulator on it is not the same as eight gauge wire with no insulator. That's why you see these skinny wires carrying electricity uh, to our houses. They don't have insulation on them, so they can carry the, ins the electricity with a much smaller gauge because they're dissipating the heat into the air. And to some degree, that's what these do. And if you look at a wire gauge chart, a, a calculator, it will tell you that at this distance, at this length, well, even one foot long, one foot long at 200 amps in the air at 48 volts, you can carry that with a 1% voltage drop with 12 gauge wire. I'm not going to do it, but you can. I think that in order to, I, I believe that what we need to always do in all of our projects is aim at perfection. Because then when we miss, 
we haven't screwed up that bad. But if we aim it just good enough and then we miss, calculated wrong, something else adds up, then we got a problem. So I have a feeling I'm going to be ordering up some bus bars. Now, before I let you go, there are a couple of other things that are important in creating good joints. One is using proper tools. When you strip your wire, you need to strip your wire without damaging it. And one of these tools will do that very nicely. When you crimp, these are for crimping like the sensing wires, the little uh, lugs onto the small wire. You want it to be very consistent. It needs to be secure and you need to have heat shrink on it so that it doesn't corrode over time. But you also want to be very consistent. And this gives you a very consistent crimp, the same every time. If you use something like this, it's dependent on how much force you apply. And how much force you apply will be different from one to the next to the next. And so, I really believe it's important that we use the right tools for creating these connections. We use good adhesive heat shrink to keep the air out of them because we want this to last longer than we last. And uh, nothing bothers me more, I guess, than, than thinking about the possibility that someday when I'm gone, somebody take something apart that I built and said, who was the idiot that did this? Probably not everyone should be doing what we're doing, y'all. But if you're doing what I'm doing, if you're building these do-it-yourself projects that involve high amps and electricity, aim at perfection, think it through. It probably will be okay, shouldn't be in your uh, vocabulary. <laughs> and keep learning. Stay humble, because if you don't stay humble, you will get humiliated. Oh, man, what have I done? Thanks for staying with me, y'all. Y'all have a good day, and uh, thank you for watching the video. Please subscribe. Hit the like button. All that other stuff that people always ask you to do. I never realized how important it was till I decided I wanted other people to interact and comment. If you disagree with something I've shown here, I want to know about it. I'm trying to learn. Have a good day.